while discussing the united nation system we saw that there are six principal organs of the united nations now in this lesson we will be looking at one such organ which is the general assembly which is the primary legislative organ of the united nations the 193 member nations of the united nations are the member of the general assembly as well in fact the general assembly is the only such organ of the united nations where all the 193 members of the un are also a part of it automatically this allows the general assembly to be a unique platform for multilateral discussion or discussion involving multiple parties which covers the wide spectrum of the various international issues as mentioned in the un charter now this feature of the general assembly often earns it the nickname a world parliament as just like a national parliament various representatives come together discuss and debate on pressing issues and then pass legislations similar is the case for the general assembly the difference is that each representative is representing one nation each and all of these nations are coming together to discuss and pass resolutions on issues having international importance over here we see a glimpse of a session of the general assembly now the general assembly meets once a year at the un headquarters in new york now the general assembly is headed by a general committee which acts as the administrative wing of the general assembly this general committee is comprised of the president the vice presidents and various other chairpersons of the general assembly now over here in this picture the lady we see is vijaya lakshmi pandit an indian diplomat who served as the 8th president of the united nations general assembly and thus was heading a general committee for that subsequent year as mentioned 193 member nations are part of the united nations general assembly now each of these member nations can send a permanent delegation having up to 5 representatives Now let's look into detail at the leadership structure of the general assembly who convenes over the various sessions of the general assembly who makes sure that consensus is maintained while voting is taking place for these purposes the general assembly elects a new president and 21 vice presidents before the start of each session every year over here we see the pictures of the president and the vice president of the general assembly respectively the president for the year 2018 was from ghana and one of the vice presidents for the year 2018 was from indonesia now according to the article 21 of the united nations charter the president and the 21 vice presidents assume their functions from the start till the close of the session for which they are elected therefore we understand that the president and the vice presidents are elected for a particular session and they hold their power till the period they hold their office which is for duration of one single session now apart from the president and the 21 vice presidents the general assembly also has six chairpersons who head six different committees of the general assembly each committee specializing in particular fields so the six chairpersons of the six committees along with the president and the 21 vice presidents together comprise the general committee of the united nations general assembly which provides leadership and direction to a general assembly Now, while electing the 21 vice presidents and the six chairpersons of the six committees, there needs to be a certain rule kept in mind. These vice presidents and chairpersons are to be each elected from different countries, hence each representing different zones of the world. This is done in order to avoid groupism and to ensure the representative structure of the general assembly. Thus, we saw the composition of the general committee. this is not a political committee and it instead works with the secretariat as the administrative wing of the united nations general assembly now apart from the traditional system of leadership general assembly also has a special form of leadership and that leadership is derived from the various heads of states 
who are the elected heads of the governments of the various member nations. These heads of states often participate and preside upon various important sessions of the General Assembly and in doing so they provide direction to important discussions and often lead to successful resolutions. Over here we see a glimpse of Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India and Joe Biden, the President of the United States of America, presiding over various important sessions of the General Assembly and thus in turn giving the Assembly a unique sense of direction. Now, each member nation of the United Nations General Assembly can send up to five representatives in their permanent delegation. But despite this, each member nation is entitled to only one vote in the Assembly. This is because the United Nations Charter bestows upon all member nations equal status. Therefore, in the General Assembly, one member nation is equal to one vote. Now, over here we see a glimpse of the voting being conducted in the General Assembly. Now, in order to exercise their one vote, every member nation has three options. They could either vote in favor, against, or could simply abstain from voting. This is how they could exercise the one vote entitled to them. Now, while every member nation is entitled to one vote, all decisions are not done upon the same majority. Now, when we talk about voting, we generally understand that the side which gets more than half of the votes or more than 50% of the votes is the side that wins. This is known as simple majority and this also exists in the General Assembly. In case of all ordinary matters, where decisions on ordinary matters such as general administration only require half majority. However, some discussions are more important and therefore they demand more consensus. These could include discussions on peace and security, discussions on the budget which talks about how the funds of the United Nations are allocated and where they are allocated. Also involving the admission of various members to the United Nations and also the expulsion of various member nations if they do not follow the United Nations Charter. Finally, it also involves the elections conducted by the General Assembly, particularly the election of non-permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. In these cases, a half majority is simply not enough and therefore two-thirds majority is required where two-thirds of the members present need to vote in one direction. Can you answer this question? What majority is required to decide upon the budget of the United Nations? Is it a half majority, a three-fourth majority, a two-thirds majority or a two-fourths majority? The correct answer is a two-thirds majority. Thus we were able to see at what scale the General Assembly operates. Now the General Assembly manages to bring together 193 member nations to debate and discuss important international issues and to also pass resolutions and plan of actions concerning these discussions. However, these resolutions are not binding on the various member nations, which means that they are not bound to abide by it. Therefore, we understand that the scope of the General Assembly is rather limited. This is because the General Assembly cannot launch any form of direct action on its own and is instead primarily serving as a recommendation body for the Security Council which is the executive organ of the United Nations and where the work really gets done. But then a question might come up, is this the only purpose of the General Assembly? Can the General Assembly never rise above this recommendation function? Well, there is only one exception where the General Assembly can truly take action on its own and that is through the Uniting for Peace Resolution. Now, the Uniting for Peace Resolution is a landmark document which gives special executive powers to a General Assembly in times of emergencies. This particular resolution which was passed in the year 1950 became so popular and well recognized that it has a symbol of its own. But why was this resolution passed? Well, to understand that, we have to travel back to the year 1950. 
Now let us see the background behind the uniting for peace resolution. Now to say that the world was peaceful after the end of the Second World War would be a lie. There were various regional conflicts that were popping up around the world. And such was the case of a conflict in the Korean Peninsula. Now it's important to be mentioned that after the Second World War, Korea attained its independence and was subsequently divided into two new countries, North Korea and South Korea. In this picture, you can see the DMZ is the border between these two newly divided nations of North Korea and South Korea. Now in the summer of 1950, war broke out between North Korea and South Korea. Now while this could have been any other regional conflict, it did not become so because of the ongoing Cold War, which is a period of intense ideological conflict between the two superpowers, USA and USSR, which made these two superpowers pursue any means possible to continue the conflict instead of direct confrontation as they feared another world war. Now when Korea was divided, North Korea fell to the influence of communism under the Soviet bloc and South Korea accepted capitalism under the US bloc. When North Korea decided to invade South Korea to get more territories, both the superpowers found this to be a great opportunity to wage a proxy war. You see, USA and USSR felt that if they support one party each in this ongoing conflict, they can continue their ideological conflict but can still avoid direct confrontation. Therefore, they turned the Korean War into a proxy war for the US-USSR conflict. Over here, we see a picture of the North Korean army moving into South Korea aggressively. And over here, we see a newspaper headline showcasing that North Korea has declared war on South Korea, thus starting the Korean War. Now, what was the United Nations doing at this time? Was it to become another League of Nations which could not stop a conflict? Well, the United Nations did pass two important resolutions to deal with the Korean conflict going on. And this was done without any resistance as USSR was not attending the Security Council due to various reasons. However, things changed when USSR returned to the Security Council right in time for its turn as the president of the Security Council itself. Now, USSR came back to the Security Council at the height of the Korean conflict. And in fact, it showed all signs of intent to veto any resolution that has to deal with launching UN action to put an end to the conflict. USSR did not want the Korean conflict to end and was thus determined and showed all possible intent that it would not let any such UN action to be launched. Now, every permanent nation of the Security Council is entitled to a veto, a power which lets them suspend any ongoing discussion, voting or debate regarding the passing of a resolution. Now this veto cannot be blocked by other permanent nations or the Security Council itself and the nation who enforces the veto does not even have to explain itself. Thus when USSR rose up to the presidency of the Security Council as you see in this picture here, it concerned the other permanent nations of the Security Council, particularly USA. You see, USA feared that in the current situation, the Security Council would move into a period of deadlock and thus the only thing that the USA could do was to turn to a General Assembly. As according to the UN Charter, the General Assembly does not have any provision of veto. In the General Assembly, USA initiated Resolution 377A in October of 1950. Over here we see the US representative giving his speech while initiating the resolution 377A, also popularly known as the Uniting for Peace Resolution. As mentioned, the Uniting for Peace Resolution was initiated by USA in the October of 1950 as a means of circumventing or a means of preventing any further vetoes of the USSR. And because the representative of the USA was able to appeal to all the major nations, such a resolution can help the world avoid another world war. They all supported the resolution and thus it passed in November of the same year with majority votes. Therefore, the Uniting for Peace resolution was passed by a majority in the General Assembly. Now, what is it that this particular resolution say? 
it set the ground rules according to which the general assembly could adopt this resolution and also in future cases could adopt the same let's look at these ground rules the general assembly can adopt this resolution if all the members are convinced that the security council has failed and is failing to maintain peace and security as it is required by the charter and if this has happened during a period when the world is facing an aggression of some form or any threat to peace such inefficiency of the security council if found to be caused by a lack of unanimity by the permanent members and the misuse of the veto power would add more ground to the passing of this resolution once the resolution is passed the general assembly would act as an emergency executive body which is far more representative and much less restrictive than the security council the general assembly can make direct recommendations to its members to pass resolutions involving collective measures such as sending peacekeeping troops containing troops from all nations to neutralize the conflict so we saw that through the uniting for peace resolution general assembly can even call for armed action if required so the uniting for peace resolution quite clearly helps the general assembly rise above from its recommendation role and this is done primarily so that the united nations system never freezes or paralyzes and is not done in any manner to undermine the power and the responsibility of the security council Now, since this particular resolution is passed in times of emergencies the powers that are held by general assembly by the passage of this resolution are also temporary but what if the general assembly is not even in session when the need for passing this resolution comes well for those situations the general assembly can in fact meet using special sessions especially to pass this resolution in case of any further security council deadlock in fact the very first time this resolution was implemented and adopted it was through a special session a picture of which you can see over here now this resolution has been implemented for a total of 12 times each single time through a special session So the United Nations General Assembly Resolution Number Three Seven Seven A is forever remembered as the Uniting for Peace Resolution, a resolution which gives emergency powers to General Assembly. Now we were able to understand the power which General Assembly holds and can also exhibit when required. In this lesson, we focus upon the structure of the United Nations General Assembly. In the next lesson we would be looking at the various functions this particular organ has. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so add delta step learning is not just fun and easy it is rewarding too so register for free now